Good morning, Redeemer, and Happy New Year. Um, I will be reading our scripture this morning, which comes from Daniel chapter 3. So if you have a paper copy, go ahead and turn there, or you can look at the screens beside me and read along. So Daniel chapter 3, starting in verse 8. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the fiery furnace. Thank you, Emily. First Corinthians got wild, huh? Just kidding. We're not in First Corinthians today. Welcome to Redeemer, you guys. Glad to be here. My name is Cody, and I just want to say Happy New Year's. Thank you guys so much uh, for being here this morning. I serve on staff with our college ministry team. That's how deep we're reaching into the bullpen this morning. We're here. It's going to be great. But I'm glad to be here with you guys. When Dusty asked me a few weeks ago um, to, to teach, he said you can teach on whatever you want, uh, just so long as it comes from the Bible. I said, great, okay, so we're going Daniel 3. It's gonna be great. If you're new here, normally we spend time working through books of the Bible, but for this week and next week, we're gonna be doing a couple of standalone sermons before jumping back in to 1 Corinthians. And as I was thinking and praying through what I wanted to talk with you guys about today, I was reminded of something that my church, my home church uh, did, you know, back whenever I was in high school, every so often, in between sermon series and on kind of non-regular holiday Sundays like today. What they would try to do instead of fitting in some, you know, connecting sermon series or whatever is they would take time to preach on something that God has been personally showing them over the past few months, year, whatever it is. They would call it preaching your journal, preaching your journal. So that's what we are going to do today. I wanna share with you guys something that I believe God has been trying to teach me over the past few months in hopes that it speaks to you as well. And so today, again, nothing to do with 1 Corinthians, way off, other side of the Bible. Instead, we're going to be in Daniel 3. This morning, we're going to be talking through the story of the fiery furnace. So a little bit about me. I know I'm a kind of a random up here. I did not grow up in church at all. I came to faith uh, later in high school. I didn't read the story that we're talking about today until I was 19 years old. And no, I had not seen the VeggieTales episode. Apparently, it's good. I've heard it's a banger. I don't know, though. I, but I remember exactly where I was the first time that I heard this story. I was working at Pine Cove, camp in the city, again, as a 19-year-old, sitting on the ground next to a bunch of second graders in this dingy church gym, listening to this story like on the edge of my seat. As a 19-year-old, I had no idea how this story would end. And so whether you're new here and that's you, or whether you've read this story a thousand times, I'm excited, I'm glad to be here with you guys. And so our direction for today, it's pretty simple. We're going to take a look at the story. We're going to talk about what this story is saying, 
We're gonna talk about what the story is not saying, and then we're gonna do our best to apply it to our lives today. So context, Daniel 3. The story is set over 2,500 years ago. God's people, Jews, Israelites, they lived in a city called Jerusalem, and they got this enemy nation called Babylon. Babylon invades Jerusalem. They wreck the city, and Babylon takes the people of Israel into captivity back to Babylon, ruled by King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar, who is a self-proclaimed big fan of himself, he builds a 90-foot-tall statue of what? Of himself, which is wild. (laughs) That is absolutely wild. Beyond this, King Nebuchadnezzar, he decrees that any time music is played, Throughout the city, everyone must stop what they are doing, bow down to this golden statue of himself and worship him. And anyone who doesn't is immediately sentenced to death by being burned alive in a fiery furnace. Great dude, great dude. And that's perfectly fine for most of the people in Babylon, except for the newly stolen people of God who are now living as slaves and as exiles within the city, who do not see King Nebuchadnezzar as king and who already have a God for themselves. And so insert three faithful men of God, Jewish men who are part of the people of God who are taken from their home, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So to summarize the story from the beginning of our time, you get these three dudes who are just refusing to bow down to the music when it's being played throughout the city. King Nebuchadnezzar gets upset, calls these dudes into his presence and says, hey, you got one more chance before you're getting thrown into the fire. So go ahead and do that. They say, no thanks paraphrased, we're not going to bow down, king, and he gets really mad, and he throws them into the fire. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they get thrown into this furnace, but to everyone's surprise, they're in the furnace, but they're doing great. Not burned up, not harmed in any way. This is it. This is our story, that that despite all odds and opposition, these three men, they persevere in faithfulness to God in the midst of suffering, and God delivers them. And so those are some themes that we're going to be using this morning, suffering, faithfulness, and deliverance. And when we read stories like these, or when I read stories like these, we tend to, or I tend to, focus on these miraculous deliverances from these seemingly impossible situations. That makes sense. These are crazy stories. But I think that God has more for us today than just a really cool story about miraculous deliverance. I believe that this story teaches us so much of the value of faithfulness in light of suffering, regardless of the outcome, regardless of the outcome. This story, it has a lot to say about our own faithfulness to God. Okay, so first up, what this story is saying. What this story is saying. Should be up on the screen. Point one, suffering is inevitable. So before getting too deep, I want to define suffering. Elizabeth Elliot says that suffering, this should be up on the screen, Suffering is having what you don't want or wanting what you don't have. Having what you don't want or wanting what you don't have. I think that's beautiful. And so suffering, according to this definition, it could be a few things. To have something that you don't want. This view of suffering, it could be some type of weakness, some type of difficulty, some type of strife, some type of lingering illness, difficult relationship dynamic, on and on. Or on the other side of the coin, to want something that you don't have. Maybe you want a stable family, a better support system, to not be in debt, to not struggle with addiction, to be in a relationship, to be in a better relationship, to not be in one at all, on and on and on. For these brothers in our story today, their suffering, it's pretty clear. According to our definition, they were in the process of receiving that which they did want, namely death by being thrown into a fiery furnace on account of their faithfulness to God. Within this story, we see a very clear picture of what it looks like to suffer due to your faithfulness to God. This is real, and this is common. We read story after story of brothers and sisters in the faith who suffer for Jesus. Elizabeth Elliot, the one whose definition of suffering we just used, she defined suffering after her husband was murdered on the beaches of Ecuador for trying to bring the gospel to people who have yet to hear. So suffering on account of faithfulness to God, it looks like this, but it can also look like missing out on friendships, social relationships, jobs, careers, etc., because you want to honor God with the commands of Scripture in regards to how you should live your life. That's one way to look at suffering. On the other side of the coin, suffering could also have nothing to do with being faithful to God. 
It could look like dealing with the consequences of a silly decision, dealing with the effects of just living life in the sinful and broken world or suffering on account of other people's sin. It doesn't matter where it comes from. Because of sin, suffering, it is inevitable. Hardship, it marks each of our lives on some level to some degree, suffering is inevitable. Okay, what the story is saying, point number two. God cares about our suffering regardless of the cause. God cares about our suffering. God cares about your suffering regardless of the cause. God knows that it is inevitable, that suffering, it is inevitable. And regardless of the reason for it, he cares about us and he is with us in it whether it's self-inflicted, suffering, suffering as, just as a result of living in this broken world or suffering for Jesus, God cares for us. And so if we have not met yet, an important part of who I am is that I'm both a husband and a father to two incredible kids. And so if you haven't spent much time with kids, they love to get hurt. They just love it. They're addicted to getting hurt. My daughter, Lydia, sweet little curly-headed Lydia, she hurts herself on a daily basis, she's two years old, so she's, you know, that makes sense for her. But her getting hurt, it is inevitable. And this happens primarily by way of just tripping, falling, living life, landing on something, spilling something, whatever it is, running into things, whatever it is, as her father, I am consoling her several times a day due to her just living life, getting hurt. Living life, getting hurt. So something else that you need to know about Lydia is she is so fiery. She is wild. She, Lydia, she has more attitude in one of her cute little fingers than my older son, Gray, has in his entire body. So with Lydia being two years old, she has a lot of big feelings, a lot of big feelings. And so what she would do whenever we would, you know, tell her no, redirect her, you know, just generally be her parent, is she does this thing where she gets so mad, red in the face, and just arches her back and throws herself back on the ground, hits her head, creating an entirely new problem. And so when she does this, this type of injury, this type, she's okay most of the time after she does that. So don't worry, guys. This injury or this suffering, it is 100% self-inflicted. But it doesn't matter. My posture and my willingness to care for her does not change. It doesn't matter whether life hurts her or whether she hurts herself. My heart is to move towards her, to be with her, and to care for her. Matthew 7, 11, which I think should be on the screen, it says this, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good gifts to the, or give good things to those who ask him? So the principle from this passage is that if I am able to care for my daughter when she is suffering, how much more is God able to care for us, his children, when we suffer? God is a good father who moves towards us, not away from us in the midst of our hardships. And so maybe you're in here and you have really suffered through this life. I know some of you who this is your story and none of it has been your fault. God cares about you in the midst of your suffering. Or maybe you're in here and you're on the other side of that coin and maybe you've suffered because you've caused a ton of pain in your own life and in the lives of others. The story is true for you. God cares about you're suffering. Or maybe you're in the middle, life's just kind of going decently, but there are points of hardship and struggle and suffering that pop up from time to time. The story is the same. God cares about you right now with whatever is going on in your life. God is our good heavenly father who cares about our suffering regardless of where it comes from. And God was the good heavenly father protecting Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 2,500 years ago as they were being thrown into the fiery furnace. These brothers, they were suffering on account of their faithfulness to God and God cared for them. For Lydia, my daughter, when she is wounded by life, regardless of the reason, care often looks like a hug from her dad and sneaking some chocolate when her brother isn't looking. For these men, God's care looked like physical protection and deliverance. Let's take a look at Daniel 3, verses 24 through 25, right as they're about to get thrown into the fire. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men 
unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. So fourth person, it's a little crazy. You, if you're reading quick, you might miss it. And there, there's some debate about who this fourth person in the fire is. Some theologians call this event a Christophany, which is just a fancy word for meaning a physical appearance of Christ before his incarnation, before he comes to live on earth. Other people think that it is an angel of the Lord protecting these men. For our time today, we're not gonna get into it. Does it really matter who it was? Because what we do know is that either way, God was caring for these men in the midst of their suffering. And whoever this fourth person was, it was a physical demonstration of God's care for these men in the midst of their suffering. God was with them in the fire in the same way that God is with us in our metaphorical fires. Okay, part two, what the story is not saying. The story is not saying, should be up, yeah, there we go. The story is not saying that God will deliver you from all forms of suffering. And for me, as someone who didn't grow up in the church, this is an easy ditch for me to fall into when reading this story. This story is not saying that God will deliver all of his people from all forms of suffering each and every time. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they knew this. And so let's take a look at what they say right before being thrown into the fire. Verse 16 and 18. Daniel 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king, but if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. You can leave this verse on the screen. What we see here is that these dudes, they look the king right in his face and they say to him, we are not going to bow down. We know that God is able to deliver us and that God will deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down, even if it costs us our lives. These men knew that God could. They even expected him to deliver them and knowing that even if God doesn't, they won't bow down. They are going to continue in faithfulness to God regardless of the outcome. So for us, whatever hardship that you're going through, whether it's self-inflicted suffering, suffering for Jesus, or suffering as a reality of sin, God cares for us in the midst of it. But God caring for us in the midst of whatever we're going through does not mean that he is going to deliver us in the same way that he delivered these men. He might give us total deliverance from your suffering. He might give you total deliverance from whatever in the world is going on in your life. He can, but he might not. But from this story, from, this, from these verses, we get a formula of sorts to deal with and interact with God in regards to whatever we've got going on in our life. So this formula is gonna be up on the screen. So when you consider the ways in which maybe you've suffered this past year, what's one of the you know, first things that come to mind? Don't, you don't have to shout it out, but it probably doesn't take you long to think about it. What is something that you are asking God to do in your life currently? Okay, so how I read this passage and how I interpret this formula is this. God, I know that you can do blank. God, I believe that you will do blank, but even if you don't, I will still follow you. So example from Daniel 3, God, I know that you can deliver us. God, I believe that you will deliver us, but even if you don't, I will still follow you and I will still remain faithful to you. And so how, like, how would you guys fill in this blank this morning? You take a few seconds to just consider, it probably doesn't take you long, for me, here is one way that I'm currently, I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can apply this to your life with all the different things that we've got going on. But one of the ways that I am currently applying this to my life is at some level, I suffer because my dad has yet to believe in Jesus. Going back to our definition of suffering, I want something that I do not have. I want my dad to come to faith in Jesus, but that has not happened yet. He's heard the gospel many times and nothing. So here's how I could apply this formula from Daniel 3 to this situation in which I'm currently suffering. God, I know that you can save my dad. And I believe that you will save my dad. But even if you don't, you're still good. And I will still walk faithfully with you regardless of the outcome. God may save my dad today. God may never save my dad. But my posture towards God and my faithfulness to him should not 
change. When we experience suffering or hardship, regardless of where it comes from, God, he wants us, as a good father in heaven, he wants us to give what we've got going on to him, knowing that he loves us in the midst of it. As we give our pain, our suffering, our ask, our wants to God, we are simultaneously called to believe in faith that he has the ability to give us whatever thing that we are asking for, whatever is going on in our lives, all the while knowing that he might not do it. He might, but he might not. Yet, our call is to not waver in our faithfulness to God regardless of the outcome. This is what I believe that this story is all about, persevering in faithfulness to God in the midst of suffering regardless of the outcome. And that's all great, but what do we do with this? Two points of application that I wanna put before you guys to consider, and it'll be up on the screen. So knowing that suffering is inevitable and that God cares for us in the midst of our suffering, one, how can you acknowledge the hardships of your life and bring them to God? If you are anything like me, you contend, we contend, I contend to minimize my own suffering because most of my suffering isn't anything like the suffering from the story that we just read. Like I'm not about to be thrown into a fire for Jesus anytime soon, Lord willing. Or or maybe you don't minimize your suffering, but maybe you're in here and you bury your suffering. Maybe you're in here and you just suffer in silence. God wants you to give whatever you've got going on in your life to him. And so during our next two songs, during our next worship set, what could it look like for you to just bring these things to God? Maybe for the first time, maybe for the first time in a long time. And what if God would care for you with that thing that you're trying to avoid, that we try to run from? We all do it. What if God cared about you with that? Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says this, a beautifully encouraging passage. It says, for we believers, that's us, if you place your faith in Jesus, this is true of you, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us, believers, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Do you hear this? Scripture says that Jesus knows what it's like to be you. And because he knows what it's like to be you, he can give us mercy and grace in our greatest time of need. Jesus knows what it's like to suffer and he suffered and died so that you would be able to bring your hardships to God, that we would be able to bring our hardships, bring our pain, bring our suffering to God and receive what? A cold shoulder? No, mercy and grace. Point number two, knowing that suffering is inevitable and that God cares for us in the midst of our suffering, what is God asking you to be faithful with? What is God asking you to be faithful with? Daniel 3 and the story of the fiery furnace, it isn't only about God doing crazy things and delivering dudes from a fire. It is about that. But this story, I believe that this story is meant to highlight the faithfulness of these dudes so as to encourage us today to continue in our own faithfulness to God. We need this encouragement today. I need this encouragement today because in our suffering, in our hardships, our obedience and our faithfulness to Jesus, it tends to slip. When life presses us on all sides, this is when following Jesus and doing the hard work of persevering in faithfulness gets most difficult. I know that I personally if you know me, this is not a shocker at all, that I have a tendency to get kind of flighty when things get difficult. You can ask my wife, when things get hard, doesn't matter the degree, I start sending her like vacation ideas, like Airbnbs in Europe, you know how they just pop up, you know, I'm like, get out of here, I'm not asking for that. It's like hut, mud hut in Ecuador, you're like, yeah, that sounds great, let's do that. Get those, you get cheap flights to Mexico, it doesn't really matter what it is, but I know that I have a tendency to try and escape or vacation my way through hard times. If you were to read my journal, I feel like over the past few months, God has been asking me to enter into the life that I currently have and stop trying to get around everything that's hard, to enter in. Now, not tomorrow, but now. Not in the future, but today. Or said differently, I feel like God is asking me 
to be faithfully with the, to, to enter in faithfully with the tasks and the people that are in front of me, regardless of how well life is going. So for you, this morning, today, end of 2023, what is God asking you to be faithful with in this season of your life? You just heard where I was at, our story from today. Obviously, the three dudes, they knew that God was asking them to be faithful, to not bow. But what is it for you? This might not be your situation, but what is God asking you to be faithful with in response to the word of God today? What is God asking you to do with what you've heard? When you consider the new year, we love new years. I love new years. My calendar is like spotless right now. It's incredible. We love it. But what is God asking you to be faithful with and prioritize in 20? 24. Some of you, that thing maybe immediately popped into your mind. What next steps do you need to take? Who do you need to talk to? What is God asking of you? Or maybe it's tied to what you put in your formula earlier. What next step with whatever hardship you've got going on do you need to take with Jesus? And so referencing back to our story, Daniel 3 it is a blurry picture of the care that God has given us in Jesus. Let me say that again. Daniel 3 It is a blurry, dimly lit picture of the care that God has given us, followers of Jesus in 2023, in Jesus. God cares so much for us that he looked at us in the midst of our sin, in the midst of our rebellion, in the midst of our disobedience and self-inflicted suffering, and he moved towards us. He had mercy on us. God saw us and he moved towards us, not away from us. He moved towards us with provision and deliverance. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's deliverance, it looked like surviving the fiery furnace. Our deliverance comes in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, Son of God, on our behalf. Christ was faithful where we were faithless. And contrary to what the world is saying today, we are utterly unable to deliver ourselves from anything, especially the consequences of sin. Scripture says in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death. What you get from sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so maybe your next step this morning is to come to Jesus, is to give your life to Christ. If you've yet to come to Jesus for salvation, God has made a way for you to be made right with your creator through Jesus because he loves you. Not because you could ever do enough, but because He loves you. Remember, God sees all of the messes that we have made and he moves towards us, not away from us, in love and in mercy because he loves you, not because he just wants you to be better. So don't build 2024 on anything other than this reality that God loves you. Maybe you're in here and you are a follower of Jesus and you just need to be encouraged. And so the truth of this story is that whatever that you are going through, God is able to, to carry you through it. God is with you through all of the ups and downs of your life, of 2023, of 2024. And in my own life, God has carried me through many of these difficulties on the back of my community. If you're new in here, hear it from me. We want God to transform your life during your time at this church. And we believe that God primarily does this through community. And maybe you know that God is asking you to get involved in a GC or to get involved in a grow group. Who knows? but maybe that's your next step. And so if you're interested, you can fill out a connect card in front of you and just write GC and somebody will reach out. But this story, as we begin to wrap up, the story of the fiery furnace, it is absolutely about what God is capable of doing on behalf of his people, but it is primarily about persevering in faithfulness despite present circumstances. He, God, he is a good father who knows what we need. He cares for us and he has provided everything that we need to love him, to persevere in faithfulness, primarily by Christ's life, death, and resurrection on behalf of all who would believe. God has given us everything that we need. And this belief, it gives us true hope in the fact that ultimate deliverance, ultimate restoration, it's coming. When Christ returns, scripture says that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes and that everything will be made new. Believer, that is in your future. Because this is true of our futures, we can have hope today and we can allow God to carry us today. Real hope, real grace, real mercy. It is available today, this morning. So I'm gonna pray, but before I do that, we can put the formula back up on the screen for just a second. 
Why don't you take just a minute, sit there, probably doesn't take you long to think about what you've got going on, but how would you fill this in today? How would you fill it in for 2023? How would you fill it in for the new year? What are you asking that God would do? And while you ask God to do these things, whatever that thing is, would you also ask God to help you to continue in faithfulness regardless of however it goes, regardless of present circumstances or regardless of the outcome of what you're asking for? So I'm gonna pray and then we will continue to worship. Lord, we, uh, we thank you for today, God. We thank you for your word. God, we thank you for Jesus. Um, Thank you that your mercies are new every morning and every year, God. Um, Pray that we would just bring our struggles to you, that we would receive help and grace, and that, God, you would help each of us with whatever our next step of faithfulness is to be faithful to you and to worship you and to serve you today and into the new year. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.